This video is sponsored by Squarespace, so this is a little bit of work, but it's a fun way to make the chicken breast interesting again. Just make a quick stuffing and roll it up. I'm making two big portions, and I'm starting with like a 50 gram chunk of dry chorizo. You could use any sausage at all, but if you're using fresh sausage, not dried, you'd want almost twice as much because it'll boil off water. The key with a dry sausage for stuffing is cutting it into the smallest pieces possible. I'm just sawing thin strips, and from there, saw into matchsticks, and from there, saw into a fine dice. I do find a back and forth Fourth sawing motion works much better than a chopping motion with dry sausage. Man, I love chorizo. Smoky, garlicky, red flavored. I don't know. It's awesome. The Iberian peoples know from sausage. And here's a shallot. Any form of onion is fine, but we only need a little, and shallots are small, so one shallot. Very fine. Grab a pan, and I'll throw those in cold and turn the heat on medium underneath them. Fat will render out of the sausage in time to cook the shallots. I'll just stir those every now and then. Meanwhile, I can prep my chicken, one side of a breast per person, and it's time to butterfly them. I'm just cutting into the thickest parts very carefully and open it up. I'll show you that from the side. Heading into the thickest part, trying to cut its height in half, stop before you go all the way through and open it up like a book. If you've got thick parts, you can kind of make slits across them and or lay some plastic over to prevent splattering while you pound them out. Focusing your attention on the thick parts, the thin parts will need hardly any smashing. For years before I had this meat pounder, I used a heavy bottomed pint glass. That's fine as long as you don't Hulk smash it. I'll just get the meat as flat as I can without tearing it apart. Done. Back over at the stuffing, the shallots look pretty cooked. If using fresh sausage, you'd want to get it looking pretty dry and crumbly. Now I'll pour in a roughly equal quantity by volume of breadcrumbs. This is panko because that's pretty much the only kind I keep around anymore, but any breadcrumb is fine. I've done this with cornbread crumbs before. That was amazing. I'll just let that toast a little for flavor, and then it's time to deglaze the pan. These mini bottles of white wine are quite convenient for cooking. You could use water with maybe a splash of vinegar vinegar at the end to taste instead. There's still some brown stuff over there to get off. I want that flavor, but I also want enough moisture in the pan to make the breadcrumbs moldable, just barely moldable. Off the heat that comes, and since I'm going to have my chicken with lemon, I might as well put a little zest in the stuffing. It really freshens up the chorizo, as will a bunch of fresh herb. I'm using dill because I have some, and I like it, but thyme or parsley would be great. Stir that up, taste it. It only needs a little more salt because the chorizo is so heavily seasoned. Very nice. Still crumbly. If it was really wet, it would be kind of gummy in the end. And before I roll this up, I'm going to do myself a favor and cut a bunch of strands of butcher's twine. Get it done now while my hands are clean. Each piece is long enough to wrap around the chicken and tie a knot, and I'd say five strands per piece. Keep those scissors. We'll need them again. Now, stuffing onto the cut side of each piece of meat. This piece is a little bit bigger, so I'll need a little more. Keep that pan. We're going to use it again. This is a one-pan dinner. And then whichever side is more tattered is the one I want to hide inside the roll, so stuffing all the way to that end and then roll it up. I've left a little strip uncovered there at the end to make a seal. Done. And because we topped the cut side of the meat, the firmer and smoother surface is now the outside of the roll, which is good. Hmm, this one is not going to work rolling in the same direction. No worries, I'll just roll this from the tail instead. This is good, because it'll get me a piece of about the same thickness, even though it's smaller. It'll cook in the same time. There, it looks like a pig's trotter. Now I'm just going to wiggle my first length of twine underneath there and do a surgeon's knot. That's where you go across and then under once. That's an overhand knot. And then you go under again. Pull taut. And the extra friction we get from going under twice holds it for us while we lock it off with a normal overhand knot. Easy. Repeat. I wish I could tell you that you could just secure these with a toothpick down the middle or something, but that just doesn't work. Chicken breast is too delicate and irregular. The toothpicks aren't secure enough, but this isn't too hard. I snip off the excess just to keep it out of my way. It looks like a couple of lobster tails now. And if you were making these for the in-laws or something, you could do this much the night before and put them in the fridge. I'm ready to cook these right now, so I'll get some salt all over these. Pan back over medium or medium low heat and coat with olive oil, let it get hot, and I'll lay in the chicken. And this part would probably be easier in a non-stick pan. In a stainless pan, you got to really let each surface sear firm before you nudge it off the pan, or else it'll shred. I'm getting a little bit of shredding, whatever. I'm just gently coloring all sides, and at this point, you could throw the pan in the oven. I would only do that if my oven was already hot for something else. Instead, you could throw some butter in the pan, melt it, and just kind of roll them around in there. I think that does the same thing as basting. It just doesn't look as sexy, but it still takes a long time to get the inside of these up to temperature. For this particular recipe, I found the best thing is to cover them. If you don't have a lid, some foil is fine. Just let them steam in there the rest of the way. Check on them frequently and roll them around. About 15 minutes after they went in, this smaller one is approaching 160 Fahrenheit, 70 C. I actually wished I'd pulled these a little sooner. Carryover heat is going to raise these like 10 degrees Fahrenheit as they rest. Unless you really need to play it safe, I'd say pull these no further than 155 or 68 C. Those can just rest while we make our side. 
I'm dumping out any burned bits of stuffing that fell out and the butter if it's looking burned. But that fond on the bottom is looking golden and perfect. So back on the heat it goes and in goes a bunch of green beans. I think that was a six ounce bag, 170 grams. They taste even better if you let them fry a little bit in the dry heat. I should have done that a little bit longer. But eventually you gotta deglaze. I'm using the rest of my mini bar bottle there. Again, water would be fine with a little splash of vinegar at the end instead. Just scrape that pan clean, get all those beans coated and on goes my makeshift lid. Heat up to high, just let them steam maybe five minutes. But check on them frequently because if too much of that liquid evaporates, it'll burn instantly. I'm just tossing in some water whenever needed. Keep steaming. Taste one to check for doneness and seasoning, some pepper and salt, and a little more thyme. The easiest way to get these strings off is to snip them with clean scissors and then peel them off, get rid of them. This is not necessary, but some fresh butter in the green beans at the very end is nice just to make a thicker sauce with the pan jus off the heat. Now it's really important to slice this up with a freshly sharpened knife, otherwise the meat fibers will just shred. You'll have done all this decorative work for nothing, but look how pretty those are, little meaty pinwheels. When it's time to transfer this to the plate, you can just kind of mash it back together, press and lift, and deposit. Fan those out a little to show off, get those green beans. This is my new favorite thing, cooking my vegetable in the pan with the fond while the meat rests. Synergistic! And then last, and not optional at all in my opinion, is a lemon wedge. This is the sauce for the chicken, gotta have it. Get that darn seed out of my thumbnail. You know, it's not an everyday dinner, but it's a fun little project and a way to get creative with chicken breast. You could stuff it with all kinds of things, and those green beans glisten like a new website from Squarespace. Just like that chicken, Squarespace has everything you need rolled up in one place. There's dozens and dozens of site templates you can quickly customize with a built-in image editor. There's a logo maker. There's all the inventory and payment processing tools you need to sell stuff. There's scheduling tools so people can make appointments with you or make open table reservations. There's site analytics and new search engine optimization tools that make your site findable. There's enterprise solutions if you're not working alone but you have a whole company that needs a site. There's email marketing tools so you can send out blasts from your new professional email address that you also got from Squarespace. It's all in the same delicious swirl. You can get a taste for free at squarespace.com, start working on your site, but when you're ready to buy a custom domain through Squarespace or publish your site and make it live, do us both a favor and save 10% at squarespace.com slash Thank you, Squarespace. Now, go roll one up yourself.